Okay, so um, as I just mentioned to Paul there, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different this time. So we thought for fun, we would try to avoid the one person speaking for a long time, especially if that person is me. So just about everybody in the group will take a turn um, at some point um, being involved in this. And we decided to organize this around a section in our webpage called Top 10 Tips for Molecular Replacement. So we're going to uh, present this in terms of uh, the tips for how to think about things when you're doing uh, molecular replacement. So first, just to make sure everybody knows what molecular replacement is, it's another method of solving the phase problem where you kind of borrow the phase information from a re related structure. So most of the time, if you determine a structure, there will be something else in the PDB that has a um, reasonable sequence identity, so you know it'll look like it. So here's a model from the PDB. Molecular replacement involves rotating that molecule into the right orientation, translating it. So here's a copy of that protein in the unit cell, and then you apply symmetry and you generate positions for basically all of the atoms in the unit cell, and you can calculate phases and apply them to your experimental data. And that uh, gives you a combination of what your structure looks like and what the, well, it should look like the, like your structure with a little bit of model bias towards the PDB structure. And you can carry on from there. So top tips. Number one, it's kind of self-serving. It's use maximum likelihood in phaser because um, you haven't got any other choice in Phoenix, but uh, there are a number of advantages of using likelihood, which is why we developed phaser. The, the big thing about likelihood is that it's a probabilistic method. So it's built on the idea of taking account of the effects of errors. So it accounts for the errors in the model and it accounts for the errors in the data, uh, which is important, especially for difficult problems. Um, another advantage is that if you place one component, and we'll see that in a quick demo later, that increases the signal for placing the next one. <clears throat> Uh, the third one is the likelihood score, the log likelihood gain. So it's gain because it's how much better is our score than having a model that tells us nothing, like just knowing that there's atoms somewhere in the crystal. So a positive number is, is good. It's on an absolute scale. And you can say that if we try several models, the best one is one that gave you the highest LLG. It um, also tells you how much confidence to have in the solution. So we'll probably hear a bit about that later, but if you get an LLG value of more than 60 or so, that you can be fairly confident the solution is correct. You can also compute an expected LLG that you'll hear more about um, in uh, the talk that Claudia and, and Massimo will give you. Okay, the next important thing is to use the automated search in phaser. So, uh, what we found is that if we look at a lot of problems, <clears throat> most problems that can be solved by molecular replacement can be solved completely automatically by phaser using the defaults that it has. And that allows it <clears throat> to search for all of the expected copies of all components in one job. So let's say, you know, one of our test cases is a toxin with five B subunits and one A subunit. So you can search for all of those uh, components, copies in one job. And if you let phaser do that, then it will do a better job of um, balancing the different choices of strategy. And let phaser decide on the resolution limits, the choice of all alternative space groups, what strategies to use and what search order to use. So there's a uh, complicated flow chart here, which shows you basically what's going on in a phaser job. And it includes things like calculating the expected LLG given the quality of the data and the quality of the model how big of an LLG do I expect to get? And then you make decisions based on that. <clears throat> um, we're going to be mentioning a number of pieces of software. The main one, the central one is Phaser, but there are also programs you'll hear about. Sculptor, which trims off things that are probably wrong in your starting model. Ensembler, which makes an ensemble of superimposed um, alternative models. A uh, tool called, called Phoenix MR Model Preparation, which is a really handy way of preparing a, a bunch of possible models, and Mirage, which is a, a pipeline for doing automated molecular replacement. Yeah. So I've set this up already with one of the tutorial examples. You can uh, 
get to that just by hitting new project and going through the kind of things Tom showed you. And it's the first uh, tutorial in the molecular replacement section, complex of beta lactamase and an inhibitor protein. So all I'm going to show you here is just how do you do molecular replacement in phaser, and I'll explain a few things as we go along. So I opened up the molecular replacement uh, part of the GUI on the right, and I'm going to run the a phaser MR full featured. In fact, I recommend that you use that and not the simple one component interface because it's not hard to use the full featured one anyways. So it opens it up on the wrong window, but I can move that. Okay, so this is the phaser molecular replacement GUI. You have to fill in things under different tabs to run the job. Start with the title. So we're going to solve beta plus blip automatically. So the inhibitor is called blip. Doing automated molecular replacement, we need a data file. And we have an MTZ file here with our data. Select that, open that. Reads in some information automatically, cell dimension, space group, etc. cetera, which um, data you're using. For this test case, we only have the amplitudes. We prefer if you use intensities and the sigmas of the intensities if you have them. Okay, now the next thing we have to do is set up our models. We refer to those as ensembles because in principle, they can be an ensemble of superimposed um, models, which it takes a, uh, makes an average from. In this case, we have um, proteins that are identical to what we're trying to place in the complex. So we don't need to do anything uh, special with them. So I'll call the first one beta for beta lactamase click on add file, choose the PDB file for the uh, beta, beta.pdb. And I need to say how good of a model is this? And this is referred to as the variance or the, you know, the size of the error. The default is to specify by identity. If I click on change variance, this is 100% identical. And I put in 100, click OK. In uh, later on, you will probably see an example where Sculptor has been run first. Sculptor actually puts something into the PDB file and it reads out the identity automatically. Okay, so I'll add another ensemble because we need two um, components to solve this. And I clicked on add PDB ensemble, open that tab, and this is going to be called blip. And I'll pick the PDB file for that one and set it to 100% identity. <clears throat> the asymmetric unit contents. Um, what's important here is that we're specifying the total amount of scattering that's in the crystal. So whether we have a model for it or not, we want it in here. It doesn't really matter how you specify it because Phaser makes no connection between the uh, composition and the models that you're using. But we uh, do it by entering the sequence files so there's a sequence file for the beta lactamase component. And then if I add a second component, there is a sequence file for the flip component. Okay, so now I have, I've specified the content. We're expecting one copy of each in the asymmetric unit. Finally, I just have to set up a search procedure. So it's set up looking for a single component. Uh, one copy, and I click on the little ellipsis here, the three dots, and that allows me to choose which ensemble is component one. So I'm going to be a bit perverse here, and I'm going to choose blip. So blip is actually smaller than beta lactamase, and it's a poorer model to start from. But I want to show you something um, by doing that. Now, people get confused here. If you click on this again, it allows you to add another PDB file, but what that means is that we have an alternative model for this component of the crystal. That's not what we're doing. We're looking for two different components in the crystal. So we have to add a search, which adds another component. And then we can specify what is our model for that component. And this will be beta. Now, notice the little checkbox here, determine search order automatically. That's going to fix up my bad choice of which order to specify these in. And that's basically it for searching for two components. If I hit run, then it um, starts running. 
uh, does some data analysis, corrects for anisotropy, looks for translational non crystallographic symmetry, figures out the expected LLG, and then decides that beta lactamase should go first, even though I said blip first, and uh, calculates a rotation function. Now, where is it going to tell us? Okay, um, it's chosen a resolution limit. Oh, sorry, it's jumped ahead of me here. <laughs> Going too fast. So for the searching for the um, beta-lactamase component, it decided all it needed was five angstrom data, and that was also part of that ELG calculation. Um, then it searches for blip after it places beta, and it's doing some refinement. It'll be finished really soon. Um, if I did it, if I forced to do it in reverse order, it would work, but it would be much harder to find the blip component without getting the information from the beta lactamase component. Because basically, when we do um, two components, if you know one of them, you have less about your data left to explain. Okay, so a couple of things that you can look at here is the log likelihood gain score. Remember, I said 60 is good, so if you had two components, 120 would be pretty good. Well, here it's over a thousand, so this is a really easy uh, case. Another thing that's good to look at is a translation function Z score or T of Z. And we'd like to see a number more than eight or so. 30 is obviously excellent. So these are two things that tell us this is almost certainly correct. The other thing is the fact that it only found a single solution. So it found a unique solution. So we can just open it in Coot to see what it looks like. And <clears throat> if I just display the C alphas, then let's turn off the maps for now. If default colors in Coot are not great. Um, there. OK, so you can see that it's actually put it together as the complex, and you can see the complex between beta lactamase and blip. So that's um, basically the introduction I wanted to give you. So now we're going to hear about more difficult problems from a number of people. And I think we're going to switch over to Early next. So I'll stop sharing. No, I'm the one. <laughs> no. Oh, sorry. It's Claudia. Yeah, sorry. It's not you. No worries. Claudia, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so I hope to you see my screen and I'm gonna put it in person. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, do you see my screen? Right? Yes? Yes, Claudia, yes. Uh, okay. So uh, Randy has spent some time uh, telling you about molecular replacement in general and in particular in, in phaser with maximum likelihood. And he has also pointed out already the fact that the, uh, the there are two main two very important aspects for molecular replacement, which uh, one of them is the data, I and mean, this is the one Early will discuss later, and the other one is your model. So in this short talk, we're going to be uh, talking about the model, about the different questions we might have, like whether to use a single model or maybe multiple ones, as we will see in the form of ensembles. How should we prepare them for molecular replacement? And I also would like to go very quickly over a few of the concepts that are very relevant for model uh, evaluation prior to running the molecular replacement and, and, and in the molecular replacement itself, which are the RMSD, so the deviation, the sequence identity, and the expected energy that also Randy mentioned. So I'm going to start first by the uh, expected energy. So it, the LLG, the expected energy is a score uh, that uh, it's telling you what is the log likelihood gain score that you will expect for a correctly placed solution. And it depends on various factors. So it depends on your resolution, on the total number of reflections in your data, but it also uh, relies on the errors in the calculated structure factor. Those errors can come because your uh, model is partial, so it is only one component, or even a domain, and also from the RMS, the error that the coordinates of, of your model have when compared to the, to the target. And this error can come from different uh, uh, places. So this deviation, it is, of course, something that until we solve, our, also we solve our target structure, we can only estimate it. And yes, traditionally, it has been only uh, computed considering uh, the sequence identity between the model and the target. And it is, it, it is a good estimation, 
especially for cases where your sequence identity is, uh, is good, is high, is over 30% sequence identity. Uh, still, this is not the current way in which we estimate the RMSD in phaser, so we do something else. Uh, the, the expected RMSD, it's a function of the, of the sequence identity, but it is also taking into account the size of the model, because the, the size is going to be affecting also in the way the deviations behave, and, all, and others uh, uh, like also, that also contribute, like the resolution of, your, of the model uh, to which the model was determined, the geometry quality, and all of the description of these factors you can find in this couple of papers. What it is more important is that this can be estimated uh, and that uh, it can be refined against the likelihood functions, and this is relevant for, for our discussion. Uh, uh, I will be showing uh, very soon uh, what is the way I would suggest for you to find um, possible models, possible homologs, but before I want to spend a couple of minutes in, in discussing two programs in Phoenix that you can use for improving your models and that Massimo will show practically next. So the first one is a sculpture. A sculpture can do model improvement and it can do from very, let's say, simple or obvious modifications like deleting the residues that are not there in the alignment. So removing main chain, let's say. But then also uh, do some more sophisticated things like mutating your uh, residues and uh, removing the side chains that are not preserved in your target uh, or trimming them to um, a, a smaller to just main chain. And even uh, more, uh, uh, let's say, sophisticated things like modifying the B factors, awaiting them for the um, segments. Well, not the, yeah, so putting uh, the sequence similarity or, and, and the structural flexibility considerations into the, the B factors by weighting them up or down. Uh, the other program that we'll show is Ensembler, and it's uh, the program in Phoenix that will allow you to generate those ensembles from dimensions. So these are sets of multiple models that are superposed and trimmed to a common core, like as you see in this image. And uh, they will uh, represent a, a rough template of your uh, expected target. And as you will also see, uh, it in many cases, if you have multiple models, this is the best way to go because it might uh, prove a better search model than the individual counterparts without ensemble. And I will not go over the workflow because uh, Massimo is going to show it to you with a, a particular case, which is, uh, I think it's also one of the test cases, but we don't expect you to follow at the same pace, so don't worry. So this is a case at uh, 2.4 uh, Armstrong resolution. And well, the data is uh, more or less fine. Here I'm showing another output from a Phoenix uh, software, X3H, except for the completeness. And what I will show before handing over to Massimo is where I will recommend you to try to find your uh, models. So I'm sure most of you uh, are aware of uh, searches uh, with BLAST, for example, but uh, we will uh, recommend you to use uh, the HHPRED server because it is quite powerful for finding more distant homologs and it will provide you, let's say the same homologs that you will find with BLAST, but then even more. And well, I'm gonna, I have already run the job, but I'm gonna show you. So for launching it, you just need to put the sequence there and, and then just uh, hit, in your case, submit. And here you can see the output. So uh, before I go over the, the output here, just to mention that you can download this output as a raw file that you can then use in the, uh, in a sculpture and in the other programs like Massimo will show. So you will need to click on that. And here you have your uh, list of, uh, of hits. And if you go down here, you have a table. In this table, you have different scores uh, that are related to, the, to the, the quality of your alignment. So you have typical the E-value, which is like the chances that your uh, alignment will be uh, good by, let's say, um, randomly. So this is a number you want to have the smaller, the better, but there's also some other things like, for example, this uh, server is comparing the prediction of the secondary structure of your target to the uh, secondary structure of the models in the PDB and giving this a score. There's also, of course, the size of the alignment. And at the end of the day, all these numbers are combining this uh, probability you have here. And uh, you can see in our case, for this test case, we have 
multiple models. So uh, we will see now what Massimo can do with uh, these models. Okay, thank you, Claudia. So I will try now to share my desktop. And hopefully now you are seeing my comma line. Is it right? Yes. Yes. Okay, fantastic. So Claudia show uh, how to download the HHPRED and uh, file, and we are going to use that. Um, what we want to do now is to create an ensemble and use that ensemble for performing molecular replacement. Okay, so the first thing is have a look to the, uh, to the file, the HHPRED file, which is a text file, and you, you will see here the same content uh, displayed in a different way uh, that uh, Claudio already shown. Uh, we are not going to use the first it because it's actually the, exactly the, our, the structure that we want to solve, so the target structure, but we are going to create an ensemble using the, the other three that are um, coming next. Okay, so in Phoenix, there is a very nice tool that you can use from command line uh, to download a PDB file uh, very fast and quickly. So you just need to do phoenix.fetchpdb and then you just write down the uh, PDB ID, like in this case. This will bring to uh, the current directory where you are working the PDB file that you need. So if you now go to the uh, um, to the uh, Phoenix GUI, then uh, you will find the tool that we are going to use on the tab molecular replacement. And on Sculptor is the first soft software that uh, we are going to use to manipulate uh, to PDB. Uh, you have to load the PDB that you have um, uh, just downloaded in this way. And then you also need to uh, put add the sequence of the target structure, uh, which in this particular case, it's a FASTA file there. It is very important that you put also the chain ID here because otherwise you will get an error. So you have to uh, uh, put also the chain ID of the, uh, the, the part of the structure that you want to um, um, extract. And then you just uh, run the job. Uh, the usually sculptor is very fast. In fact, it's already finished. And you will, will also get a, a sequence identity uh, that is uh, being associated to this model. So 19.28, it's not uh, usually a standard very good uh, uh, sequence identity for molecular replacement. Um, uh, usually we like to have at least models that have 30% of sequence identity. Uh, but uh, uh, this model in combination with other models uh, from the um, from the HHPRED uh, can lead to a, a successful an ensemble. So now, because we want to create an ensemble, it might be tedious to repeat the same operation for all the uh, PDBs uh, that uh, we need to download. Uh, so there is another command line tool that I like to use, which is Phoenix MR model preparation. And you can use that for just feed the HHPRED file that you have downloaded and also uh, you can limit the number of uh, of its or entry that you want to process automatically with Sculptor. And in this case, I put four because I want to skip the first one, which is the target structure. So now this is a part of being a very good and fast way of uh, performing uh, um, Sculptor on multiple uh, on multiple entries. It's also a better way if you want because uh, you are going to use directly the HHPRED file, which contain details on the uh, alignment uh, and its uh, and the precision of the manipulation of the file will be higher if you do in this way instead of using just the target structure. So you see now that you have a list of uh, PDBs sculpted. And now we can proceed to create the uh, ensemble. So again, in the molecular replacement tab, you can click now on ensembler. And this time we are going to add the list of, uh, of the uh, PDBs that we have sculpted. We just uh, uh, skip the first one because it's the target structure. And we just add the second, the third. And for the fourth, we are going to use the chain D as, as uh, shown in the HHPRED. Then we also need, so we add this, and, and also we need to add the target sequence again, which is the sequence.fasta in this case. 
So of course you can give a job title. Uh, uh, and uh, what is important, there are several parameter parameters that you can modify, uh, but uh, at least the most important one is the trimming, uh, because uh, uh, if you activate that and you also give a threshold, you establish the, um, uh, how um, you are going to remove all the residues, all the, all the, um, uh, all the parts of the of the models that do not align very well with the core structure. This might be very important for molecular replacement because you are uh, decreasing the RM, the total RMSD and the agreement with the, among the models. You are increasing the agreement of the of the models. Okay, so you just run uh, the job with uh, by clicking on run and this. Uh, will click, uh, uh, will very fast uh, create the uh, ensembles that we should be able to uh, to see just clicking on uh, um, on this button here, uh, opening code. And yeah, okay. So we can open now. Uh, we are going to see that this is in fact is an ensemble. And because you, you can see easily that we have several superposed model. They are they superpose very well and we have uh, found a core that is agreeing. And so this is ready for being used for molecular replacement. I just want to show you um, that this is in fact uh, has been removed uh, some not necessary residues. And I will do that by opening these preloaded, preloaded um, files. And here you can see after loading all of that and we put all to C alpha and then we just are going to show the ensemble again. And now we can see that if, if we open a, a complete sculpt, uh, just sculpted model, we, we can see that there are uh, more um, more secondary structure that are that, that is actually not uh, uh, being included in the ensemble, and that's because it does not align very well with the core structure, or they are not present in the alignment. Okay, so now we uh, I want to show you only that uh, you can use that for molecular replacement, and uh, um, you can do that by clicking on again on phaser and MARF feature. And after you give a, a name for the for the job, you insert the data as um, um, as shown by Randy and preloading uh, several information about the data. And then again, uh, you you can add the ensemble this time uh, for the ensemble. Uh, you don't need to specify any variance because everything uh, is going to be uh, read directly from from uh, the um, the PDB that has been created by ensembler. In fact, the default here you see it's auto. It means that uh, everything is ready to be uh, um, to work with uh, with phaser. Then you, uh, you have to specify the number of copies um, in this asymmetric unit and uh, of the given sequence that for the target structure, which is here. And then uh, in the search procedure, again, you uh, specify the model and how many times you want to search for that model that this time is an ensemble. Okay, so I have already run that and I would just want to show you the comparison uh, between um, uh, between a run with uh, the en with an ensembler with an ensemble and a run without uh, with a single model, and you can see that if we look uh, if we try to solve the structure with uh, the ensemble, then we end up with a clear solution, uh, a single solution with high LLG, uh, super high uh, zeta score, and this is definitely the correct solution because it's a single one and we have all the indications that are right. So we can proceed uh, um, uh, auto building or refining. But in the case, uh, if we try to, to solve the structure in, for, in particular with the second um, uh, sculpted model, the one that is um, the, the second one that was coming uh, in the HHPRED file, then you end up with a, with a run 
that is not so clear. Remember that we didn't have a very big, uh, a very high uh, sequence identity. We have 46 MR solution now and uh, not so clear LLG and a zeta score that it's uh, uh, possibly indicating that something is might be good but really it's not uh, it's not uh, it's not easy to detect if this is the correct solution and also this run took a, lo a lot of time so um, that's uh, for telling you that um, ensembles usually do not harm uh, molecular replacement and if you have multiple models uh, multiple homologs uh, and that you can extract from the HH spread file, then it's, reason, it's reasonable to create an ensemble with the uh, automated tools that we have. Uh, um, and also you can always uh, try several uh, phase runs uh, with different configuration and always compare the LLG and the CETA score because as Randy was mentioning, they are comparable uh, for the same type of, uh, of uh, data. And say, said, uh, said so, I will leave uh, now to uh, early that is going to um, show you how you can actually deal with that with the data. So uh, yes, hello Zoomers. <laughs> this is a 15 minute talk about some of the problems that you can encounter uh, with molecular replacement and hopefully some of the solutions that you can use to overcome them as well. So uh, hopefully all your crystals will grow and look as beautiful as the ones on the left here in uh, Rupp's uh, Crystal Gallery. But of course, it's not how beautiful they look that counts. It's what happens when you put them in the X-ray beam. And what we're looking for are beautiful either separate spots, uh, uniform size and shape, although just different intensity, of course, um, well separated, diffracting to high resolution. But even that, uh, is not necessarily an indication of whether you're going to have problems or not, because inside the crystal, uh, those diffraction intensity intensities um, can represent crystals that are twinned or um, that have translational NCS, and that can cause you problems. So uh, just by looking at them, of course, you can't tell. Uh, they say if you've got sharp edges, you get high resolution diffraction. If you have uh, curved edges on your crystal, you can end up with low, low resolution. Um, but I've seen crystals that look really um, quite rounded on the edges and they still give you high resolution. So there's really not much you can deduce just by looking. Right, so um, this is just an overview of, of crystal growth. When you, when you look in the PDB and you look at crystal structures in textbooks, they show you beautiful lattices. They're ideal lattices. That's what you get when you uh, fire up Coot or Chimera and you look at your crystal lattice on the screen. Crystals are real physical things. They grow as the result of a chemical reaction and things can go wrong in the course of growing. Uh, so uh, all the interesting action occurs at the bottom end of this curve on the bottom right hand side here where you have uh, the non-specific aggregates forming and then specific aggregates. Uh, the the uh, video from Newcastle shows what happens after the critical nuclei have formed uh, and the crystals start uh, growing uh, hopefully larger and larger. But this is a physical process and I, I love this video um, from El Sustain from Ward's group at NYU which just shows uh, that these are real physical things that grow with domains, they have a, they have a internal structure uh, and that it's this internal structure that can lead to uh, the problems, for example, of, of twinning. So we're going to talk about twinning, high mosaicity, uh, low resolution, translational non-crystallographic symmetry, and anisotropy as um, pathologies for crystal structures. I divide these into two categories. Uh, some of them, high mosaicity and low resolution, are things that you can only really overcome by going back and looking at growing better crystals, or perhaps better data handling, better cry cooling, uh, beta, better data collection strategies, really optimizing your experiment because that's gonna give you the best data um, for, this, for the later structure solution. But anisotropy twinning and translational non crystallographic symmetry, these are problems of pathologies that you can solve in the computer. There's lots of tools to help you with that now. It's becoming more and more automated. We're working on making it even more automated. Uh, but at the moment, you still need to understand a little bit about what's going on um, in order to make optimal use of these tools. 
So what's twinning? Twinning is, is the association of two or more individuals of the same crystalline phase. And how does it come about? Well, it can just come about because as part of this uh, uh, chemical uh, reaction that uh, gives you the, uh, the, the crystal growth uh, it can occur during the nucleation phase. It can also happen when crystals grow into each other, uh, following a phase transition, for example, with changes in heat uh, or, or salt in the crystalline uh, conditions, or when you touch it, when you try to try it, mount it for, for, for data collection. There are lots of different types. Uh, but the types I'm going to introduce you to here are pseudomerohedry, merohedral twinning, hemohedral, tetrahedral, particular merohedry, alloy twins, and uh, not all of the other types. Um, so this is a video I made uh, a couple of months ago uh, using orange juice cartons to explain uh, the different types of twinning. Uh, so twist, uh, the orange juice cartons are, are great for this kind of thing. They, because they have a, P, a P1 space group, that's the picture on the outside of the box, but the cell of the box, the box represents an orthorhombic cell. And they also are great because they have a two to one ratio of the sides to the edges of the A to B cell, for example, um, which is going to come in useful in a minute for explaining um, another type of twinning. So you can think of these uh, six packs of, uh, of juice containers as the crystalline blocks, and we're building them up here to make an untwinned crystal. Okay, but because of their orthorhombic, the box has higher symmetry than the space group of the, uh, of the crystals and of the unit cells themselves, you can stack them upside down quite happily. Uh, and uh, that gives you a twin crystal with what we call a twin fraction of, in this case, 25%. So a quarter of the crystal is twinned the wrong way, uh, is growing it differently. If we have a twin fraction of a half, otherwise known as a perfect twin, then we end up with uh, what looks like higher symmetry on the diffraction pattern. We can't go higher than a twin fraction of a half because of course, if we rotate more of the crystal, we just end up back with a twin fraction of uh, 0.5 again. So that was hemihedral twinning because we have only two crystalline forms within the crystal. But the good thing about these orange juice cartons, or perhaps the bad thing, depending on how you look at it, is that we can stack them two other different ways as well. And we could end up with a crystal with four different uh, um, crystalline units within the crystal, um, all diffracting um, with the spots overlaid on top of each other, but each with their own symmetry. And uh, that would give us tetrahedral twinning. So now we're going to make use of the fact that the crystalline uh, ratios are two to one. And we can see that we could also build a crystal with overlapping spots uh, with the crystals stacked, with, with the unit cells stacked sideways on each other. And that's called reticular merohedral twinning. And in that case, half the spots overlap, in this, in this particular instance, of it, half the spots overlap and half don't uh, on, the, on, the, on the detector. So there's a last form that I'm going to talk about, which is allo twinning, which is when you have the association of two completely different crystal forms within the same crystal lattice. Um, and these will give you different, possibly non-overlapping spots within the, on the detector that you'll have to tease apart as part of your integration strategy. Then we have, going back to the beginning, our untwinned crystal, which is really what we want. So one of the best ways of tackling twinning problem is to go back to your crystal conditions and just see if there's anything you can do to uh, look at your phase transition, perhaps try to reduce those um, try to handle your crystals more gently. Uh, uh, perhaps you might need to think about new crystal forms as well. Uh, failing that, you can try to collect data from crystals with the lowest twin fraction possible. That's, uh, and if the twin fraction is low enough, you can ignore it and, and, and work with the data without worrying about the twin. So this is the key thing about the difference between twinning and disorder. When we have disorder in our crystals, uh, that ends up with a diffraction pattern that's built up from the sum of Fs from structure factors. When we have twinning, the diffraction pattern is built up from the sum of two separate intensities. So you're literally just collecting the data and, land, and it's landing on the detector, the summed intensities on the detector. So that's the key difference between um, disorder, so that's uh, differences in uh, different orientations perhaps within the crystal lattice uh, one, from one unit cell to the next, um, to uh, twinning, which is where you have these larger blocks that are diffracting separately and not interfering with each other. 
So what's the effect of uh, twinning? Well, as I was saying, the, 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 the worst effect of it is that if you have perfect twinning, you end up with a diffraction pattern that has perfectly high symmetry. Um, and then you can end up interpreting and looking at your data as though it uh, has the highest symmetry. But um, of course, that what's happening inside the orange juice carton is still P1. So you have to solve your structures that was in P1, not in P2. You're going to get, not going to get, be able to get the right answer. So we, we definitely need to try to work out what the sp true space group is in the case of twinning. Um, what are the, some of the things that we can um, uh, look at to see if we have twinning? Well, the key thing is the intensity statistics. Uh, the distribution of intensities uh, with twin crystals is different. And it's different because if you have a normal diffraction pattern, you have obviously some weak reflections, mostly middling average reflections, and then some high intensity reflections as part of that distribution. When you take that, that diffraction pattern, rotate it and superimpose it on top of itself exactly, very rarely will you end up with a weak reflection on a weak reflection and a strong reflection on a strong reflection. Most of the time, it'll be weak on average, average on average, strong on average. And so you can see that the distribution will move um, back towards the middle. And so you'll have a distribution where most of the reflections have average intensities and there'll be, there'll be fewer at these extremes. So most of the uh, tests that there are, are look basically are different ways of looking at this intensity distribution to determine um, if it's changed from what you would expect from an untwinned crystal. Uh, the good news is that if you have low twin fraction, even if you've got high twin fraction, in fact, you can still solve your structure by molecular replacement without even knowing that you're twinning or ignoring the twinning. You will need a, high, a better model than if you didn't have twinning. So uh, you, you do need to really make sure you've got optimized models um, with all of these things that I was talking about earlier with your ensembling and so on to make sure you've got optimized your models before you try attempting um, molecular replacement with twin crystals. Um, how do you know that you've got twinning? Well, there are other things you can look for. A, a really good one is twin, twin, what we call twin ghosts in the molecular replacement solution. So this is where you end up with two solutions for, in your molecular, in molecular replacement, which um, they, they can't simultaneously both be true. So you end up two solutions with high, there's got one might be slightly higher than the other, um, that's rep rep represents the different twin fraction, um, different twin fractions, or low, sorry, uh, lower than perfect twinning. So that's one way to look at it. Um, you, the, uh, if you're solving something by um, sad phasing, which are not really the topic of this talk, but you could also find that you have clear Patterson peaks, but you can't solve it because again, you can't get a consistent set within one um, substructure. Um, you can also, when you look at your maps, you can end up with messy maps or uh, uh, clashes in the maps that don't make sense. Um, and then of course, the old fallback is that the R value is stuck above 30, but I want to stress that there are many, many other reasons why your R factor could be stuck above 30. Um, and twinning is only one of those things and you really need to exclude all of the others before um, drawing back on twinning. So I just wanna make a little point here about mosaicity and twinning, um, and that is, if you have very broad spots in your diffraction pattern, you can sometimes fool yourself into thinking that you have twinning when you don't, you've just got high mosaicity. And that's, um, so, oh, sorry, I should explain what mosaicity is first. So when you have a perfect crystal, all those blocks lined up exactly with each other. In fact, you don't want all the, them all lined up with each other because you'd end up with infinitely thin spots. So we want crystals that are not quite perfect, which is fortunately always the case. Um, then the more you get mosaics, mosaic, uh, these, these blocks misalign with each other, and this is hugely exaggerated. We're talking about you know, um, under, under a degree, mo degree most of the time and misorientation, uh, those spots smear out. Okay, so when it comes to integrating your spots underneath uh, uh, with the integration programs, when you have high mosaicity, the, your spots uh, are very broad. And it, you can end up integrating just the central part of the, of the intensity of all these reflections. And that will also gives you, uh, also skew your intensity statistics in the same way that twinning um, can obscure your intensity statistics. So um, that's not something you can solve once you've collected your data. Uh, that's a data collection problem. If you don't measure your intensities, uh, there's nothing you can do once uh, you've got it in the computer. So again, make sure you go back and do that properly, do the experiment properly. 
So now we have anisotropy. Um, so what's anisotropy? Well, it comes about because you have um, atoms in the structure that are moving anisotropically. And that happens because they're bonded to each other. And, and so their range of motion is, is restricted uh, along, along, the, along the chain. You will always have anisotropic motion of your atoms in your crystal. When you end up with anisotropic diffraction, that's when you have a systematic um, anisotropy in the motion of the crystal of, of the atoms within the crystal lattice. And a really good example of that is coiled coils. So with coiled coils, you have covalent bonds uh, running along the helices, uh, quite often in one direction in the crystal lattice, and then they form um, uh, intermolecular bonds uh, in the other directions in the crystal, and these are weaker. So you end up with strong diffraction um, where, where the bonds are along the lattice and then weaker, weaker, weaker diffraction um, between them. Uh, so the, the way that you can look at these intensity statistics uh, to, to look at anisotropy, anisotropy is um, using something called the Wilson plot. And we're going to be talking about this in terms of the um, uh, TNCS in a moment as well. There's a really good Phoenix tutorial that includes part of this um, explanation of Wilson plots in it, narrated by Tom Twilliger, which I would um, suggest that you go and look at. These are just a few stills from that tutorial, but you can see uh, that uh, we have a uh, plot of the mean intensity versus resolution, uh, and it shows that you have low resolution, you have high intensity reflections, uh, at high resolution, you have lower intensity reflections, and the rate of this fall off is, um, represents the B, B factor of your, of your structure. If you plot the log of the mean intensity against the um, one of the resolution squared, you end up with the Wilson plot and the slope of that plot gives you the B factor. The intensities uh, are not, uh, in, in reality, uh, have a more complicated um, intensity distribution uh, represented here for the P9, P9 data in the tutorial, uh, which you can go and look at. But as I say, you go and look at this uh, tutorial and it will get, uh, go into this in more detail. So how do we correct for the anisotropy? We look at the Wilson plot in directions in space. So that previous slide was about looking at the average in all directions. But if we take it and we look at it in different directions, you can see that the B factor is different in, direct, in different directions. And you can refine an anisotropy ten tensor that brings the low resolution, uh, sorry, the weaker direction up and the, and the stronger uh, direction down um, and gives you an isotropic distribution at the end of that data correction. So, this is an important slide because a lot of people get confused about this. Um, it's the difference between the anisotropy correction before data solution and after data, um, uh, sorry, before structure solution and after structure solution. In refinement, everything's a lot easier because you have a model, you have models with B factors and your known information is, is uh, completely different. Before, we don't, we don't know anything. The only thing we know is the Wilson distribution. So we need to uh, make a global correction um, calculated simply with respect to the Wilson B factor. Afterwards, you can start modeling this anisotropic motion in all sorts of clever and more accurate ways, for example, using TLS or indeed anisotropic um, B factors for individual atoms, atoms if you have high enough resolution. So it's the, it's the, the data correction is going to be different before and after. I want to talk briefly about the anisotropy server. Um, because data that doesn't, uh, software that doesn't take account of the sigmas as, uh, as, well, as, the, as well as the intensities um, can run into difficulties when uh, you do anisotropic scaling. Because as, as part of that process, you can introduce noise, or you will introduce noise from the weak reflections because you're not accounting for the sigma, sigmas as part of this process. Um, so the solution is to use anisotropic truncation to simply remove the, the weak data, the, the high sigma data. Um, however, within phaser, there's no need to do this because we have a like, uh, likelihood target, the LLGI target, that uh, correctly accounts for the um, intensities and their sigmas, the errors in those as part of the correction. Uh, so the, the only thing that you uh, lose as part of this process, um, the, you don't, you, there's, there's every advantage to using eyes. Um, the only thing is if you use all the data and you're summing over more reflections, it slows down the calculation. So we have a separate process which in, looks at the reflections and removes those for which there is um, very little information content coming from each individual from, e from each reflection, and then we remove those to speed up the calculation. So we have the best of both worlds. We have a situation where we're getting completely accurate um, targets, including the sigmas, 
and also the speed from removing the reflections that we know are not going to contribute to that calculation. So I hope well, you've all seen James Holton's beautiful um, uh, simulation here of different resolutions uh, of, diff uh, of electron density and showing how the electron density degrades with, um, with de uh, as, as the resolution drops. Now, the reason why I put that in as a pathology is because I, I really want to point out that everything in your life is going to be easier if you collect higher resolution data. Um, your options for models, your options for refinement, uh, your options for phasing, everything um, improves. And it's not just because um, you, know, you can see the atoms individual sets um, uh, at, at, the uh, at, uh, at atomic resolution at the end of the process. At, at, the begin at the beginning, if you th think of the sum of that likelihood target that I showed you in the previous slide, it has a sum over reflections. So every single that re reflection that you, you collect contains a piece of information that, you can con that will contribute to the signal as part of your, your structure solution strategy. So if you think of you know, every precious reflection is contributing another sum, in another piece of information into that sum, every single reflection you collect um, will really help you um, to solve the structure. So uh, if you, if we've, in the previous slide, we, I showed you how the resolution degrades. Um, this is how the more uh, reflections that you get, the models degrade. So sort of resolution and your, the models that you can use for molecular replacement are inversely related to each other. And it's related to what Claudia was saying with the, with the expected LLG as well. So uh, the, the, when you've got higher resolution data, you can use much smaller models. And but when you've got low resolution data, you have to have bigger models. The last brief thing I want to talk about is translational NCS. Uh, so translational NCS is when you have two, well, non crystallographic symmetry is when you have two or more components in your asymmetric unit that, do, uh, that are related to each other and, and, and are therefore related to each other uh, in a way that's not um, part of the full crystal symmetry. So the, the relationship between them cannot be described by a crystallographic operation, they can only be described by a non crystallographic operation. And a subset of non-crystallographic sym symmetry is translational non-crystallographic symmetry, where instead of being a rotation or a twofold, it's a straight translation of from one molecule to the next within the asymmetric unit. And you can see this before structure solution very clearly in your Patterson, because you end up with a peak in the Patterson uh, at the position of the translation vector between the two, because all of the intermolecular vectors pile up on each other uh, between the two copies. There are two classes of TNCS that are accounted for in phaser. One is uh, just two molecules related by a, by a single vector. Uh, and the reason why that's treated differently is because in that case, we actually model the rotation between the two molecules. We can also deal with cases where we have multiple copies related by the same vector. Um, the only difference in the treatment is that we do, do not try to model all the combinations of different rotations between those substructures, uh, between those uh, components. We just um, look at the, the RMS deviation and the vector between them. So this is the HYPE 1 case that we used uh, in the original paper when we first looked at um, the translational NCS correction terms in phaser. Uh, really beautiful structure, but as you can see, it's got lots of TNCS in the asymmetric unit. So I showed you the diffraction pattern with anisotropy. This is a diffraction pattern with translational NCS. Um, and you can see that the mod there are modulations in the diffraction pattern with patterns of weak and strong reflections, but instead of being in directions in space, these uh, in, in uh, this distinct directions in reciprocal space, these ones are uh, period periodic relationships um, throughout the crystal lattice. Uh, and you can see the histogram on the bottom right there showing you how the, the distribution of intensities changes um, with these modulations. As with anisotropy, we correct this in a similar way, only this time we're looking to um, remove these modulations by modeling it with these underlying TNCS parameters. And again, there's a big difference between the TNCS corrections that are done before and afterwards. Um, before we have to um, uh, try to work out what they are with respect to the Wilson distribution. Afterwards, you have a structure uh, where you can model the, uh, the translation exactly uh, and uh, do a much better job, but um, it's beforehand that's important. So, uh, of course, 
crystals being crystals, you quite often get all five of these things that I've talked about, the twinning, the high mosaicity, low resolution, translational, microscopic symmetry, and anisotropy all together in the one crystal. It's not uncommon. And because when crystals grow, they, they tend to grow, and if they're going wrong, they tend to grow wrong in lots of ways simultaneously. Um, so hopefully the, uh, the way to tackle these is to break it down into different problems, the ones that you need to uh, solve at the bench, the ones that you can solve in the computer, uh, and try to uh, tackle them one at a time, uh, and work your way through them, and uh, hopefully at the end of the day, the software will help you to get a nice structure which will be able to be refined. That's it. I need to unshare now, do I? There we go. Okay, so I think Rob uh, can yeah. take over. Yeah. So we're now going to have a round table session where we're going to talk internally, but for the rest of um, um, the audience uh, about some typical questions people they have uh, when they uh, do molecular replacement. So um, here's a question that um, often comes up. Um, so if I run phaser, I get a low LLG or low LLGs and the run takes forever. And um, what should I do then? Um, maybe Randy, you have a, an answer or a suggestion for that? Yeah, um, so I, I mentioned in my original talk that the log likelihood gain is a number that should be positive and the, more po the bigger it is, the better. <clears throat> positive means it's better than a random atom model. So that's a, a good thing. Uh, if you've got low LLGs, that means your model is, is poor. And if you were expecting to be able to solve the structure, then that means that you were overly optimistic about the quality of your model. So it could be that you've actually crystallized the wrong protein, which happens. Um, not incredibly commonly, but more commonly than you might expect. Or your structure could have a, a conformational change. So if you have a domain motion that isn't modeled in your model, then that will lead to um, uh, poor LLG values, in which case you probably want to split the thing up into domains To I think I'm jumping ahead to another question, but um, why, why does it take forever to run? Uh, it takes forever because Phaser looks at all of the solutions that are anywhere near the top solution that's found so far. So if you've got poor signal, there's many more possible solutions that are close to the best that was found, and it will just branch. And um, if you're looking for multiple components, you could have a branching of a branching, and you just get massive numbers of uh, jobs being, uh, trials being run. So <clears throat> that's what's going on. If it is really branching, um, you might be better off killing it. It's hard for us to know writing the program whether we should give up because sometimes you know it takes two or three copies before you start getting a clear signal. But that, that's what's going on. Right. Okay. So even if it takes more than five minutes, you shouldn't just dismiss it straight away. I mean, we should just carry on. No, if it takes more than a day, then you should start to really worry. Right. <laughs> so here's another question. Um, so in the multi-component search, um, which starts out well. So you're, you're using phase and you're searching not just for one component, but like in the beta blip case uh, for more than one component, say five, it goes well. It finds the first, say three um, components um, with a clear convincing signal of TFZ and LIGs. But then it really doesn't go anywhere. It, um, you don't get an increase in the LIG or the LIG you, you get is more or less the same as you had uh, when you add the next component uh, and the TF set scores uh, are pretty low. And um, maybe earlier you have a suggestion for what's going on and what to do. So I think there's two, sort of two cases for this. One is where you're searching, you're, you're the, the next component that you're placing is a novel component. So this is one that you haven't tried placing before. And, and the other case is where you're trying to place, say, the seventh of seven copies of the same thing. Um, if it's a novel component, then all of the things that Randy just said apply again. So you could just be wrong. If it's a novel, if it's another copy of, so the seventh of seven, then you've already 
uh, by the by virtue of the fact you've had really high signal for the first six parts of the of the search you've sort of done the experiment that tells you that you have a really good model to start with so what is it about the seventh placement that's going wrong well it might not be there that's the top reason most likely reason but there are other reasons as well so for example you may have a copy that has a, a high, very high b factor um, and in that case it will give a much lower signal and if when you're searching for these things you will find them um, in reverse uh, in the order of the stronger signal first going through to the weaker signal so the last ones that you place will be the ones with the higher b factor uh, and it might just be that it's a very weak model it could also be that there's some uh, slight problem with uh, with um, conformational change or, or some other reason why that molecule is different that might be part of the, the problem as well okay so when you say the component might not actually be there i mean phaser has an and Matthew's coefficient it, and guessing how many components should be there. And if you think that's right, then what would you do then? Or if it's not right? If, if, you, if you are happy that it's found six, you take it through to refinement and that you're happy that those are right, then you have to go on to the next step. So this is what um, Tom was saying, that there's a limited amount that you can do at any given step to know whether you're correct or not. At some point, you have to test how right you are by going on to the next step and seeing how far you get with it. And in automation strategies, you know, which we're working on more and more, we're looking at um, taking multiple solutions through to any particular stage, we might prioritize them, but we really, when we don't know, we shouldn't try to pick in advance, we just want to continue on and see what happens in the next round. Okay. <clears throat> so here's another question. Um, so if I run FASA and I get many solutions with really high LRGs and T of Z scores, but they're not unique. I mean, they can't all be right. Um, should I just take the top one, say one has T of Z of 19 and the other one has T of Z of 21. So I'll take the one with saying 21 and be happy with that. Um, what do you think, Claudia? Okay. So, well, possibly what might happen in that situation is that there's, there's your solution side, let's say partially correct and partially incorrect. So there's some truth uh, on them. But the way in which they are run, it can be to many of the different causes. Some of them already early has discussed, like for example, the space group, so space group issues, either because of pseudo symmetry, either because uh, there's translational MCS, maybe twinning, uh, statistical. Research. So there's many things that go. So there's part of your, uh, um, uh, so you are explaining part of your data, but and the other one, you are not explaining it. So that's why you get similar figures of many candidates, right? And I would like just to mention, because I see people is making questions. So the, here we are covering a few questions we have received like in the past in advance, but later on in the general discussion, we might be able to answer the ones that uh, stay and, and solve in the chat. So just to let the people. Okay, right. Um, so another typical question is, um, if I have a model uh, and I can see that it consists clearly of some domains and there might actually be some flexibility there, um, should I chop it into two different models? And um, if so, how would I do that? Uh, maybe Massimo, you have an answer to that? Yes, Rob, this is, as you know perfectly, this is a, a common um, problem in, uh, in molecular replacement because, uh, uh, because uh, as uh, Randy was mentioning before, you might uh, uh, have a very good model because, for example, you, you perform your alignment and you get a very high sequence identity and still you are not able to solve the structure, which does not make sense. That's because the sequence identity is only uh, a way, a simple way of expressing the real, the, the real important thing, which is the RMSD. So how different is the uh, atomic structure to respect to the to the target structure? And uh, why we can infer this uh, this number from the sequence ident identity? This is not reflecting the situation in which there are some uh, domain movements, because again, the sequence identity will be high, but the RMSD will be low. So. There are two things that we can do there. We can manually increase the RMSD, which in some cases can be enough, could, might be enough, but if the, the, the movement are really large, and we are talking about uh, several Armstrong of, um, 
of difference in the LMSD, then it is it might be better to uh, uh, to process the the original input uh, PDB chopping down the domains in separate uh, in separate files PDB files that could be done for example using a tool that we have in Phoenix uh, on the I think it's on the PDB tools tab uh, and it's called SCADS also programmed by Adley and um, and uh, you have to specify uh, how many into how many domains you want to split your PDB. And there are some algorithms there that are uh, able to uh, split in the best way uh, these, uh, these domains. Then, of course, you can search the domains in, in, uh, in, um, sequentially in Phaser. But uh, you have to all, always to look to the LLG, as Claudia and Randy and Erli was mentioning before, because if the models, if the domains are too small, Small, that might be uh, not enough signal uh, for actually finding the first, uh, the first, um, the first um, model. So the first domain. So again, um, it's matter. It's a trade-off. If you have, uh, if you have really uh, good data. So if you have good data and your structure is not so big and your domains are uh, are you know reasonable be uh, large then you can split them and uh, and you can search them independently uh, but if you are uh, ending up with a very small model then it, it might be not sensible for uh, for looking for searching um, as a search model. In that case, you also can go back to the PDB database and trying to find, for example, a similar structure in a different conformation, probably, and try uh, uh, that different conformation to see if this is actually what you have in your crystal. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for um, <clears throat> that explanation. So I think we should have uh, room for this question here uh, about homology models um so if i build a homology model um what no, would I, a... I think we should probably skip that and okay. go on to yeah. tristan because uh, we're getting close to when we were originally going to go to the main questions right okay so um if i have a convincing a uh, molecular replacement solution uh but the r3 uh is too high if i use refinement um what would you do in that case, Tristan? Uh, you muted. Um, thanks, Rob. Uh, so, well, there are there are many possible solutions. I mean, the, the first thing, of course, is to actually look at your model uh, in detail, um, relying on just molecular replacement, auto building, refinement is Sometimes you can get away with it, generally no. There, there, there are going to be places that will require some level of manual rebuilding and refinement. Um, so first thing, just go through your map with a, with a really careful eye looking at your difference map, seeing if there are things that need to be added, things that are out of density that need to be re rebuilt, all of those general model building things. If your R factors are still not coming down, well, there are, there are many possible explanations. One of those, of course, as Ellie has mentioned, is twinning. Um, of course, it's a very, very bad idea to, to refine assuming twinning if there is no evidence for it in your data, because that will just artificially push your R free down and lead you into a false sense of security, um, where you have very low R factors, but absolutely rubbish maps and uh, a terrible model. Um, uh, other things, TNCS tends to lead to um, higher R factors in general. Um, uh, another possibility is that your space group could simply be wrong. It, um, when all else fails, it's worth going back to phaser and seeing if it can find alternative space groups for your model. Um, and then simply the fact that, that modern standards tend to lean towards keeping more data rather than, than using um, I see guy as a, a um, cutoffs as a as a standard for cutting your your um, data. You will simply have higher R factors because you have more data with with higher sigmas, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Ultimately, the most important thing is is to actually look at your map. Is your your map is strong and clear and agrees with your model? Don't worry too much. Um, Focus on focus on your model's quality and the maps maps quality and its agreement and and move forward.
Right. So I think um, we'll hand it over to you, Tristan. Maybe you'll talk a bit about Isolde. Yep. Uh, let me bring that up. So this is going to be a little bit different from my normal talks about Isolde because Isolde is normally, well, what, what I, it's actually built as is a, is a model building slash rebuilding tool uh, specifically for low resolution. But here I'm going to just talk about some of the things you can do with it to inspect um, a molecular replacement result to, um, to, to see, to make sure it, it makes sense essentially. Um, and and then to move on with it. So here we're looking at the results of the phaser carbonic and hydrase tutorial, which uh, is a case where you the the search model is a um, is a is a monomer with uh, around sixty three percent sequence identity to the target. Um, and in this case, I, I have used Sculptor to actually trim that model down to, to, the, the, um, to the, the conserved residues. And Phaser places six of these, but that could be really quite confusing to people that know the biology of this thing because carbonic anhydrase is usually a tetrama. And sure enough, if we look at where we're looking now, we see in gray, yellow, pink, and orange here, we, we do see a tetrama which you're looking down the middle of. But we also have this, this dimer sitting over there, over here. And now that could be fairly confusing um, when we first look at it. But if we open this up um, in as older, where we, uh, we have, uh, as we scroll around here, we have live symmetry views coming up. As we come over to this, this extra dimer, we suddenly see these two uh, ghosts. And they are actually the crystallographic symmetry equivalents here, making up that second tetramer. And so that actually makes perfect sense in this case. And if we use the command here, uh, clipper sim hash one, we can actually bring up um, a representation of all the symmetry axes in our unit cell. So what we're looking at here, if I scroll out, is first the, the thin lines defining the box of the unit cell itself. And these thicker lines here, if I scroll back in and look closely at one, right? Uh, two colored saying that this is a, a twofold symmetry axis. This is a, a C2 space group. And then the, the dashed lines coming up here are um, uh, the uh, twofold screw axes. And so if we look at this, um, this tetramer here, we see this. Um, so let me find my bearings. This tetramer here, we see this twofold symmetry axis coming right down the middle of it. So showing showing our, our twofold symmetry. So that's all well and good. Um, other things that we do want to look at um, while we're at it is remembering that Phaser placed six individual copies of your um, model in here. So let me just get rid of that for a second. Um, Remembering that Phaser placed um, six individual copies of an original monomeric um, search model is worth coming in close and just looking at these interfaces to make sure they make a certain amount of sense. And in particular, there are no really severe clashes between them, suggesting some, some problem with the solution. But ultimately, the real key to, to, to checking your solution is to, of course, to uh, look at the maps. Now, with Isolde, you have two options uh, with, with maps. Uh, one is to use the pre-calculated amplitudes and phases. And the other is just to load your actual experimental data. And unless your data is really poor and needs some very careful treatment that Isolde isn't capable of yet, I, I generally um, recommend loading the data. And that will bring up the maps looking like this. And if we just zoom in, on any really fairly random place, we see fairly quickly that this is the sort of map you really want to see from a molecular replacement solution where you have really nice strong density. It's all almost all agreeing very nicely with your model. And where it doesn't agree with your model, such as here, 
it's telling you very clearly what should be here. And if we hover over this residue, for example, we can see that this is this should be a phenylalanine. And this is this is one of the mutation sites from, from the search model. So it's been been trimmed back by Sculptor. And it's showing us that this should be a, a phenylalanine sidechain. And if we really want to, we can um, We can we can actually drop that in fairly easily. Um, roughly into place. And then when we, we if we were to start a simulation, which we won't be doing in this case, then that that will fall into place quite happily. Um, and another fairly random example from here, a, a lovely site here where we can see, okay, we have a cysteine, we have another cysteine, we have a histidine here and an acid and this lovely green blob in here, which is telling me pretty clearly that this is probably a zinc. And again, we could easily. And for, um, okay, and while I just generally chat away, now because the, I've loaded from the data the maps, I will be that adding those, those atoms has triggered a map recalculation in the background for, for a model this size that will take um, five, 10 seconds, 20 seconds or so to recalculate bulk solvent, et cetera. But eventually that will um, give you a blob. But essentially, well, this, as I've said, that this is a, a really nice um, straightforward case. Other things we can do here, um, if we just select our whole model, um, and increase our mask radius a little bit. We can just mask out our whole asymmetric unit and then look for, um, and it's taking a little while. And then look, look for unfilled density in here. In this case, everything is actually pretty happy that, well, actually here we go. Here's, here's a um, stretch that um, is in need of need of rebuilding. It looks like there's some extra peptide in there that could be re that could be built. And I would think in this particular case, auto build would would deal with that quite happily. Um, is there anything else you'd like me to to add to this? Or no. Are we no we're good. Yeah, I think the yeah. time is getting. Okay, okay. Well, actually, one just last time. thing. While we've been looking at all of that, we see our, our maps have recalculated while we while I was showing you other things, and that zinc is now really quite happy. Of course, needs refinement, but is, is generally happy in that site. And I'll stop the share there and pass it back. Okay, I'll just wrap up really quickly then. Um, that, yeah, that worked. Okay, I just wanted to. Uh, <clears throat> say a couple words just to wrap up. Um, so this has been a bit of an experiment to see how it works. It took a little longer than we might have thought, but I hope we haven't run over too much. Uh, there's, this was inspired a bit by the top 10 tips section of our website, which you can look at. Uh, there's also more information on the Phoenix website. And if you have any questions <clears throat> that we can't get to today, we're always available to answer questions by email. Um, wouldn't mind having some feedback if you think that the, this way of presenting things instead of one person talking for an hour was good or bad idea. Um, other than that, I just want to say thanks to all of the members of the group that contributed to this and thanks to all of the members of the Phoenix Project for um, the great collaboration that we've had over the last 20 years. And I think it's probably time to move on to the um, general question session. Yes, thanks, great. Thanks Cambridge team. Thank you all for great presentations.